Let's, uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer first. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for allowing us to be here, God, for blessing us with uh, just so many blessings that we don't even know or understand. And thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. And I thank you for this, this church. And I thank you for the ones that are here and the ones that will be watching. And um, Lord, I ask that you bless them with, with this knowledge and the wisdom to understand Revelation and to uh, appreciate it for what it is. And that is a book that points to your glory and just exemplifies your glory and in such a unique way. And thank you for all that you do for us and your many blessings and your your name, I pray, and just give you so much thanks. Amen. All right, so this is just verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12. This is about the woman and the child. And again, this is mostly about, this is about an interpretative challenge, specifically between the Catholics and the Protestants. And I know there's 500 that's, I made that number up. You know, there's so many little different nuances that people agree with and disagree on this, but these are kind of the two main ones uh, coming from both of those groups. Uh, we've got a little bit more scripture other than verses 1 and 2 and other parts of the Bible, but we are uh, just going to be focusing on Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. So let's read those, starting at verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and pain to give birth. So the, here's the two interpretations of that. The Catholic one I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, but in a nutshell, they see this woman as Mary, um, Jesus' mother Mary. They say that this is a sign of her being crowned in heaven uh, as the queen of heaven. They call her the mother of God, which she is, but they, they use it in a not in the sense of a woman who gives birth to another, but... It's, they claim it's veneration is the word that they use. Uh, you'll see them do things like kiss statues and kneel before statues, things like that. They call it veneration. It's their, and they, in, in a greater sense, you'll probably get some pockets that would disagree with this, but in the, in the greatest sense, they would say that they're, we're not worshiping Mary. We're not worshiping statues. We're not worshiping the saints. We're not worshiping those people that's died before us. We're venerating them lifting them up. I understand that. Uh, and in a certain sense, we do that as well. We, we, we do want to venerate Mary because she was the mother of God, mother of Jesus. Uh, see, that's where they get the, the interpretation between us and them differs. We see her as the mother of the biological person that was Jesus. They see her as the mother of God. There's a very big difference between those two things. Uh, I know, you're kind of raising your eyebrows, and you're saying, well, Jesus was God, but she didn't create God. She wasn't the, the person who brought God into being. Um, now, they, they may disagree to that point, but the amount of veneration, especially their interpretation of this passage saying that she's the, the queen of heaven, they have placed her up on a much higher pedestal, and a pedestal that isn't practical, real sense, equal with Jesus Christ. And it's just not the case. Uh, Protestants definitely do. Now, what I mean by Protestants is the historic beliefs of Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and all the other million branches that we got going on. They see that quite differently. They see this as a symbolic representation of something else. Because when you look through Scripture and you look at other women throughout the Bible, Jezebel being the first example I want to give. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read it, Revelation 2, verse 20, if you want to glance back at that at some point. Um, oftentimes they will use the name of an evil woman to reference some evil act. In this case, in Revelation 2, verse 20, they refer to paganism as that of Jezebel. Not that Jezebel had somehow came back to life and that she was wandering around here in this time of Revelation. They're just using that as a symbolic representation of the two. Also, the scarlet woman. Uh, that's in Revelation chapter 17. That's a representation of the church that is apostate. Uh, if you don't know what that means, and in simple terms, that's where really and truly it's a church that claims to believe and then they step away from that belief or they radically believe in something that's, that's crazy and out there and very, very different from Scripture. Uh, the, the wife of the lamb, Revelation 19.7, uh, that is a representation of the true church, the wife of the lamb. 
And then he goes on to describe her being clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, 12 stars. Again, the Catholics would look at that, and, and they look at it as almost as literal as she's being lifted up and she's being crowned the queen of heaven and it's describing her crown that she's wearing and describing her, her person and what she looks like in heaven. I don't think so. Um, if we wanted to think about that in a way that being clothed with the sun, the sun uh, I think Protestants generally think that this description here is referring to uh, what's going to happen to Israel. In this case, it represents the glory and the exaltedness of Israel that will occur in this future time. Uh, the moon is an interesting one because paganism has taken a, a pretty big hold on the moon. Um, witchcraft and things like that. I'm one of these weird people where I, I study lots of things so that I can teach on lots of things, that being one of them. Uh, I, one of my memories of high school, I was sitting right there in uh, my typing class, they still call it keyboarding. They haven't. They call it keyboarding when you went through that. See, they call ours keyboarding. We weren't using keyboards. Oh, we were, but not. We weren't using typewriters and things like that. Um, but now they just call it typing. But back then they called it keyboarding. And I was sitting there and I was getting ready to do my lesson, and this kid was sitting next to me. I've been sitting by him the whole semester. He pulls out this big blue book and he plops it right down in front of me. He goes. Uh, you want to borrow this and read it? And it was the Buckland's Guide to Witchcraft. Uh, I've seen that book before. I've seen it in bookstores. They used to sell it at Barnes and Noble and things like that. They had it displayed up there. And I was like, no, 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 kind of scooted it away. Um, but things like that's always kind of pegged my interest. Not as, and I'm not saying like I want to go out and don a black robe and start casting spells, not like that. But it's pegged my interest because I don't know. I always had to deal with that. I, if he started asking me questions or started saying things to me, I wouldn't know what to say back at that time. So, yeah, I have looked at these things, and, and generally in witchcraft, the moon is typically venerated. They, they do most of their spells around fires, around full moons, things like that. Um, Halloween, it's always about the moon. All the decorations we have always have the moon. It's always about the moon. Uh, but the moon in their culture, it, it played a big part in it. They associated a lot of their festivals of worship with the stages of the moon. And the 12 stars, I think that was fairly easy to interpret being the 12 tribes of Israel being represented here. And it also goes on to say that, that this woman cried out in labor and in pain. Another reason why I think this is associated with Israel because many times, and I'll give you all these and I'll do it slowly if you're taking notes, but many times Israel in scripture is often pictured as a mother giving birth. Here's one example of that in Isaiah 26, 17. As the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she rises and cries out in her labor pains, thus were we born thus were we before you, O Lord. As Israel talking about how they were crying out, uh, describes it in, in labor pains. And it also occurs, and if you're writing these down, Isaiah 54. Verse 1, Isaiah 66, 7 through 12, Hosea 13, verse 13, Micah 4, verse 10, Micah 5, 2 through 3, and Matthew 24, verse 8. And the, the 24 one, we've read it many times as we've been studying Revelation because it talks about how all of this stuff is leading up like birth pains. That's not uncommon to associate these kind of birth pains, that anticipation of birth, Anticipation of that's a, birthing is bittersweet. Lacey's a little bit more fortunate because she's going to be medicated and they're going to cut her open and pull the baby out without being too graphic with that. Um, but the first time that she tried it, she tried to go into labor and she couldn't. And I know she was looking forward to it and she's excited about it, but at the same time, we all understand there's going to be pain involved, there's going to be suffering involved. It could be long hours. You hear these stories of people being in and birth for a day or more. And I can't even imagine that. But that's the way these end times are pictured. They're pictured in anticipation of this new birth, but at the same time we understand that we have to go through all these, um, th these events. All these events must take place on the earth. The wrath of God must be poured out upon the earth. Um, did you watch the lesson on the book that John ate where the angel told him to eat the book? 
told him it was going to be really sweet in his mouth, and then when he got down to his stomach, it was going to be really bitter. I believe all these associate with that, that the end is coming. It's going to be sweet, but there's this bitterness that has evolved to, to get us through there. And the same way, I mean, if you wanted to associate not with a, a future event, but the Israelites as well. I mean, look at all the suffering that they went through, anticipating that one day a Messiah would come and, and, and free them from all of this. And sadly, many of them still are looking forward to this Messiah coming. So the question, which one of these two interpretations is most accurate? Um, well, if you look at the Queen of Heaven, that's the, uh, the Catholic version of it. The problem with that, the biggest problem with that, is Mary was created. God was not. A, a created being cannot create an eternal being. It's just not possible. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For by Him all things, including Mary, were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. That excludes Mary from being this, this some type of different being. They will even claim that Mary was without sin before she conceived Jesus Christ. In other words, they'll say otherwise the the sin curse would have passed on to Jesus if, if she had sin. That, that's not, not true for a lot of reasons, but they, they venerate her to such a state that it's beyond human. I understand that there's people who live better lives than other people, but you pick the best one out and they're still not in any class that's really higher than humanity. They're not like Jesus, not in his godly sense. They're, they're just not, and Mary's not either. Uh, also, there's this example that, that only one who is to be worshipped is God. Isaiah 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. <laughs> I like that one. I am the Lord, that is my name. Something that we need to remember. And we can't, in good conscience, interpret a scripture in such a way that lifts up an individual to the point to where we praise them and to where we worship them. And again, it's about actions. Um, see, I could easily say that. If we had a statue up here of something, and I could easily say I'm not worshiping the statue, I'm not praising the statue, but what if I came in every Sunday and I bowed before it and I kissed the feet of the statue? You know, my actions are speaking very differently than what my words are at that point, and that certainly is a, a form of worship. Um, Paul refused worship for himself. That was in Acts chapter 14, 11 through 17. Herod died for not refusing worship in Acts 12, 22 through 23. That is a pretty uh, gruesome story that takes place there. If you want to read that right before bed, I recommend it, Acts 12. Uh, God's angels refused to be worshipped. We see that all throughout the Old and the New Testament. Get up, don't worship me. Uh, Revelation 22, 8 and, and 9 is an example of that. And here's the most, I think, compelling reason that this is not Mary uh, lifted up as the Queen of Heaven is that after Acts chapter 1, specifically verse 14, Mary is never mentioned again by name. She's not. Uh, I do see this as a symbolic representation. Many things in, in Revelation are. And that's the problem with Revelation. It's not a problem with Revelation, but that's the problem with interpretation of Revelation is you'll have people who say that we've got to take it all completely literally. You'll have other people who say, no, the whole thing is symbolic. You've got to find that balance. And, and interpretation of Scripture is all about balance. In other words, does if, if we... If we say that Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 is about Mary being crowned the queen of heaven, how does the other scripture line up with that? How do we deal with verses like uh, in Colossians where only God was crea or God created all things, nothing else was created without Him? Uh, how do we deal with only God is worshipped? How do we deal with that if that's going to be our interpretation? If scripture contradicts like that, it's time that we really think about what our ideas about Scripture are. Uh, so I do think this is a symbolic representation of, of Israel. 
um, bringing in the Messiah, so to speak. Uh, it seems fit, but I mean, there's there's problems with that. There, uh, sure, um, this being Mary is you, we could make it likely. Catholics do. You can read books about it, and they they try really hard to make that make sense. And you may even be convinced if you read those books. But although both of these interpretations of this have have their challenges, the only way. And this fits for anything else. The only way that we can uh, have a good, solid interpretation or understanding or even application of Scripture is to apply it to other Scripture. That is the only way that we can do that in any kind of success. And there are so many people out there that have created uh, self-persecution. And I'm going to get off onto another sermon topic here that I preached a long time ago, but this will be a quickie. Um, They'll, they have in their minds, such as we do, is blessed are those that are persecuted, right? Uh, we, we think that. But how many times do we create our own persecution? And is that what Jesus meant? So if you, uh, if Donnie comes in here and, and we decide that we want to change the color of the carpets to the color of the uh, pew paddings, and, and Donnie wants, uh, you know, like that 1970s looking plaid, his heart is set on it, he wants it completely, and, uh, you know, Yvonne wants blue. She's a little more normal. Maybe she wants blue. And Donnie's like, no, God really wants me to have this, uh, this plaid. It would be hideous, by the way. But he wants us to have this, this plaid carpet and these plaid pew paddings. And, and he thinks because people are attacking him that he's blessed because he's being persecuted. No, he's created his own persecution at that point. And we can do that with our ideas of Scripture. That was a silly example, but it's a very good point here that if you hold on to an idea of Scripture that is incorrect, and you're persecuted because of it, does that mean that you're going to be blessed? Think about that. I say not. I say that we have misinterpreted what God has meant. We have created or something out of Scripture that it doesn't say, and then by that we've created this kind of unnecessary persecution and hardship and division within the church because God wants the church to be united, and the church cannot be united unless it is united in its understanding of Scripture. And we can't be united in our understanding of Scripture unless we have a good, solid interpretation. I don't claim I'm ever going to have all the answers. I'm, I have no doubt that I'm going to die one day and get to heaven and I'm going to suddenly know all of this stuff. And I'm going to think, huh, I was wrong about that all these years. I interpreted that wrong all these years. I have no doubt. I'm human. We all are. But that does not mean that we should just, like this example of Mary here, or what they say is Mary, that doesn't mean that we should just take something and run with it without looking at the whole of Scripture. Does all of Scripture agree with that point? If one verse disagrees, we've got to, we've got to look deeper. We've got to look harder. So that was a good example for a lot of different reasons. Not so much for the end times, but that was a good example for interpretation. Any, uh, any questions? I keep looking at that clock. That clock's said the same time now since we got out of here and pre-corona. Uh-oh. Well, it's because we were sharing a story. It's my fault. You can blame it on me. That's, that's the easiest. <laughs> all right, do we have any questions at all? About any prayer requests?